This is the sixth video in a series of seven, helping you get that A star in your Women in Literature Unseen essay for A-level OCR English Literature. In this video, we'll be looking at Mary Elizabeth Braddon's 1864 novel, The Doctor's Wife. I'll summarize the text for you and provide you with key quotations in the areas of women and marriage and women as victims of men and or patriarchal structures. You'll also get a chance to write your own mini response to an unseen question from George Eliot's 1871 novel Middlemarch. And subsequently, I'll show you my response. Time now to explore Mary Elizabeth Braddon's The Doctor's Wife. First my summary and then key quotations. Sigismund Smith is the author of popular murder and minute sensation stories and good friends with more prosaic young country doctor George Gilbert. One day George goes to stay with his friend in London and is quickly struck by the beauty of Isabel Sleaford, a dreamy young girl living with her family and lodger Sigismund Smith within a chaotic household in Camberwell. However, one night into George's visit, the entire family disappear. George returns to his rural routine life in Greybridge on the Waven, but can't forget the mysterious beauty that is Isabel Sleaford. He is therefore fortunate when, a number of months later, he learns that Isabel has become a nursery governess to two orphans within the vicinity, just 11 miles away in Conventford. Isabel is still an extraordinary devourer of romantic fiction and dreams of experiencing improbable, dramatic, romantic deaths and marriages. George quickly proposes marriage to the young girl and somehow or other she finds that she has agreed, even though she knows she doesn't love the worthy, earnest young man and that the life he offers is a million miles away from her dreams and hopes. Isabel tries to be a good wife in her own way, but quickly feels bored, listless and disillusioned. However, her life changes when she meets local wealthy aristocrat Roland Lansdell, who not only has an income of £15,000 a year, but writes poetry under the pseudonym of The Alien. The pair end up meeting regularly at Thurston's Crag, a beautiful spot in the countryside between their two contrasting homes. Isabel falls in love with the intriguing, charming, fabulously well-travelled Roland, whilst he finds himself becoming slowly entranced by her youthful naivety and dreamy imagination. Isabel knows that she probably shouldn't be meeting a man alone in this potentially uncompromising way, but the relationship remains platonic and her husband doesn't seem to mind when she occasionally mentions that she has bumped into Roland and that they have exchanged books. Roland's father figure, Charles Raymond, warns the young aristocrat that his behaviour towards Isabel is inappropriate and may cause the young couple significant problems if it continues. Roland duly heeds the warning and returns to his listless meandering around Europe, but he cannot stay away for long. The siren-esque call and appeal of Isabel is too strong. He duly returns and attempts to make Isabel his mistress. They can see the most beautiful spots of Europe together. But Isabel is shocked at the idea and cannot contemplate a tawdry reality which contrasts so much with her own romantic fantasies and visions. Roland is angry and disbelieving. He has always been able to get anything else he wanted. Why not this time? Meanwhile, Isabel's earnest, practical, simple, life-loving husband, Doctor, falls ill, having caught a fever from some of his poor patients. Isabel is appalled by the idea of death and dutiful in trying to look after her husband, alongside Gilbert's stalwart servants, Mr. and Mrs. Jeffson, although she's honest enough with herself to admit that she does not love him. George Julie dies. Around about the same time, Isabel's disreputable forger father, Mr. Sleaford, has returned, keen to get his hands on some money. In a strange coincidental twist, Mr. Sleaford has met Roland previously. The latter testified against him in court, resulting in a bitter avowal to kill him once released from prison. 
Roland comes across Mr. Sleaford and is recognised. The pair scrap, and Mr. Sleaford bludgeons Roland on the head. With just 24 hours to live, Isabel, who has just lost her husband, is summoned to Roland's bedside. The dying man is repentant and even seems to have found something approaching Christianity. He dies and unexpectedly leaves the majority of his estate to Isabel. Isabel never marries again, but dedicates herself to acts of goodness and beneficence, including building decent cottages and a school for local labourers. Key quotations now, and let's kick off with the theme of women and marriage, and the views of George Gilbert, at this point a bachelor. He had very practical views upon this subject, and meant to wait patiently until some faultless young person came across his pathway. Some neat-handed, church-going damsel with tripping feet and smoothly banded hair. Some fair young sage who had never been known to do a foolish act or say an idle word. Whilst it is perhaps laudable and natural to have high hopes in terms of the qualities of your future partner, this quotation perpetuates the idea that men seem to expect unrealistic perfection in their future wife. She will be faultless and never be known to do a foolish act or say an idle word. Given the utter impossibility of the latter, even for the purest of women, I sense a slightly satirical tone here. Perhaps this quotation says as much about the ignorance and non-worldliness of George Gilbert and men of his ilk as the pressure on women to at least give the impression to possible suitors of innocent perfection. Who would care for a Venus whose cradle he had rocked, whose gradual growth he had watched, the divinity of whose beauty had perished beneath the withering influence of familiarity? Or, put simply, for men keen to find the perfect wife, familiarity can breed contempt. Part of the attraction for George is that Isabel is new. He hasn't known her as a baby or fellow child. She is a mystical, throbbing Venus to entrance him, not a past plaything who has long lost her intrigue. For when it comes to marriage, difference can attract. Hence Darcy is drawn to outspoken Eliza in Pride and Prejudice, and here George is drawn to Isabel. Vague and grand and shadowy, there floated before her the image of the prince. But oh, how slow he was to come! Would he ever come? Were there any princes in the world? Isabel seems different to many of the heroines in key 19th century women in literature texts, in that she holds a distinctly unrealistic, ludicrously romantic notion of what a future husband should look like. In Sense and Sensibility, for instance, Eleanor has no patience with any excessively dreamy romantic notions that her sister Marianne may hold. Yes, there needs to be love, but it's also essential to take account of the practical dimension, such as how much money the future husband has. Even in the more romantic Jane Eyre, the heroine does not shy away from her loved one's faults. Yes, she loves Rochester, but there is no idealisation there. He's certainly not handsome, for instance. Here in The Doctor's Wife, we see Isabel's otherworldly, hopelessly impractical, utterly unrealistic notion of a future husband, some floating prince who is going to fly down from the sky and scoop her into forever, ever la-la land. Now onto the theme of women as victims of men and or patriarchal structures. He was thinking that, after all, these bright faculties might not be the best gifts for a woman. It would have been better, perhaps, for Isabel to have possessed the organ of pudding making and stocking darning if those useful accomplishments are represented by an organ. He is Charles Raymond, and he's he is referring to Isabel's bright faculties, the fact that she has mental imitation, the highest and rarest faculty of the human brain, ideality and comparison. However, unfortunately, the society in which they inhabit pigeonholes men and women and slots them into pre-allocated roles, irrespective of how well they are suited to these. As a woman within the world they inhabit, it is an utter waste of time, Isabel, being creative and inventive, as these gifts are not valued in women, as we have already seen with Dr. John in the yellow wallpaper. Instead, to flourish in that world as a woman, far better to be experts at cooking and repairing stockings. 
If she was not George Gilbert's wife, she would be nothing. A nursery governess for ever and ever, teaching stupid orphans and earning five and twenty pounds a year. This quotation emphasises the paucity of choices and options for women within Victorian society. With virtually no career options beyond that of a governess, we've already seen from Jane Eyre just how unattractive this option is. The result is that many women have to rely solely on marriage for their future fulfilment. Here, Isabel feels that if she doesn't marry George Gilbert, a man she emphatically does not love, she will be nothing. So here we can see the way patriarchal systems conspire to ensure that dull, albeit worthy young men, are more likely to find an attractive young woman who is prepared to marry him. Her life had never been her own yet, and never was to be her own, she thought. For now that her stepmother had ceased to rule over her by force of those spasmodic outbreaks of violence by which sorely tried matrons govern their households, here was George with his strong will and sound common sense. Oh, how Isabel hated common sense! And she must needs acknowledge him as her master. This quotation emphasises the lack of freedom for women within Victorian society. Some girls may be fortunate to live within peaceful, accommodating families, keen to allow them to explore different avenues, but many are not, notably Isabel Gilbert and Jane Eyre. Once these girls marry, ownership is transferred and the husband becomes the master. Note the depressing repetition of never within the first sentence of the quotation. Her life had never been her own yet and never was to be her own. For this is how society was largely set up. The best way to acquire a degree of freedom as a woman? Marry a rich man, or somehow inherit, and hope that he dies first. Hence we have the fun and frivolous Mrs Jennings, and the hectoring despot Mrs Ferrers in Sense and Sensibility, and actually at the end of this novel, Isabel herself, albeit one tainted by past loss and tragedies. Time now for your last mini practice question demonstrate a superb understanding of the passage and the language form and structure and weave in a cheeky little reference to the doctor's wife. It's pause time. And here's my response. This passage gives an insight into the range of choices available for adult men and the narrow expectations in terms of how potential wives should behave. Lydgate is clearly a reasonably idealistic man, not wholly focused on material gain. He was bent on doing many things, not directly fitted to make his fortune. Indeed, in the first half of the passage, he seems to hold progressive views about marrying. Taking a wife should be something more than a question of adornment. In other words, he would appear to be looking for a wife who is more than someone decorative or pretty to look at. However, his criticisms of a potential future wife, Miss Brooke, confirm that he shares the prejudices of many men from the Victorian period. She doesn't look at things from the proper feminine angle. The two adjectives are revealing. Women's perspectives and viewpoints should be within narrow male prescribed limits. Rather than being encouraged to think vigorously and independently, women should ensure that they do not express strong alternative opinions, but conform to a dull, safe norm. Lydgate goes on to develop this point with a particularly offensive, for the modern reader at least, simile. The society of such women was about as relaxing as going from your work to teach the second form. This imagery unfairly compares a conversation between two adults, a man and a woman, to the tedium and frustrations of a teacher battling to impart knowledge among dullened young children. Of course, women in the Victorian period did not have the same educational opportunities as men, and so initially at least might struggle to engage with more complex topics. Nonetheless, in spite of his earlier proclamation about wanting a wife to be more than a question of adornment, it is clear that Lydgate is primarily interested in the physical appearance of his wife and how this can be soothing and pleasurable to experience. Sweet laughs for bird notes and blue eyes for a heaven. Similarly, prejudice expectations for what men want from women are seen in the doctor's wife, 
when Raymond reflects that Isabel would have been much better off if she was good at pudding making and stocking darning rather than using her imagination. Do discuss or spend a few minutes pondering, comparing to your own response.